The good rearing of the children was in the interest of all of society, particularly the primary family, who had a duty to ensure the children were educated according to their station, to guide them in the accepted customs of the Tua, and to have high regard for the family honour as a representative of the wider family unit bearing the same name. Child rearing was fundamentally a familial affair, and generally left in the private sphere by the laws. But there are two key legal manuscripts dealing with children. They are the Machschlechte, dealing with children in relation to the rules of inheritance, and the Coenera, dealing with the common early Irish custom of fosterage. The legal status of children was based upon that of their primary guardian, whether that be the father or mother or the foster parents or official tutor of the child. Between the age of 7 to 14, the guardian responsible for the child received, in addition to any other compensations, half their own honour price for any injuries against the child. But in turn, they also had the responsibility to pay restitution for injuries caused on behalf of any children in his charge. And while it was usually the father's name on the line, the female family line also retained a strong interest in the education of the children. Woe to him who was raised without rules, reminding us of the importance placed on rearing the children according to the customs of the Tua. Men had the responsibility of rearing children born through rape or deception of those deemed ineligible to the rights of the tribesmen, while the children of prostitutes and female slaves were deemed to be the responsibility of the mothers. Otherwise, while the father generally held law in his home, and most probably his wife held law over him, the responsibility to educate the young included the wider finney, or family units, and ultimately the whole community, the tribe, the Tua, who also had an interest in the youth being raised with honour and respect for the local customs and history, which easily reminds me of the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Interestingly, kings, bishops, poets and hermits were not personally liable for their own children's actions, but their wider kin was still liable for their actions. As a man came of age, he would move out of his father's hut and occupy his own hut on his father's lands. At this point, he would have the social status known as fair midboth, or a man between huts. Now, a man in his own home, though still partly dependent on his father, he was entitled to his own honour price, valuing that of a two-year-old heifer. After 17 years of age, once he moved to his own plot of land, he became known as an Ochawa, meaning a young chief or lord or freeman, a status signifying his degree of personal independence. It was common for children to be raised by people other than their immediate family, due to the widespread custom of fosterage, where children were sent to live with relatives in their extended family, family allies, or respected tutors, in order that they be educated in the skills befitting their social station, with foster parents, who are in turn paid by the biological parents for this arrangement. The rights and duties expected among the parties were set out in an old legal manuscript called the Chayan Era. The type of education owed to a foster child was discussed by Patrick Western Joyce in his Social History of Ireland, Volume 1, page 441. He said... The sons of humbler ranks were to be taught how to herd kids, calves, lambs and young pigs, how to kiln dry corn, to prepare malt, to comb wool and to cut and split wood. The girls, how to use the needle according to their station in life, to grind corn with a kern, to knead dough and to use a sieve. The sons of chiefs were to be instructed in archery, swimming and chess playing, in the use of the sword and spear and horsemanship, the horse to be supplied by their father. The daughters of the chieftain grades given in fosterage were to be instructed in sewing, cutting out and embroidery. For the neglect of any of these branches of instruction, there was a fine of two-thirds of the fosterage fee. 
Professor Fergus Kelly also wrote about the importance of fosterage in his early Irish law, saying, For fosterage to have been so widespread in Irish society, the advantages must have generally outweighed the disadvantages. Apart from the financial gain, the foster father must have benefited from the forging of links with his foster son's kin and could hope for assistance in times of trouble. The resulting emotional bonds between foster brothers are referred to in the sagas and annals and are given a monetary value in the laws. According to the dire text, if a man is killed, a fine is paid to his foster brother. This fine is payable in full only where the victim was reared in close intimacy with his foster brother, that is, a foster brother of the same blanket and of the same cup and of the same bed.